If you didn't already know, some of the most popular Android libraries that exist today, some of the most well-known, well-used, well-tested, you couldn't imagine the Android ecosystem without these libraries. Those libraries all use code generation, or at least uh, a lot of them use code generation. Things like Retrofit, Dagger, Hilt, SQL Delight, uh, basically anything that uses annotations, chances are that is looking at those annotations, generating some code, and making it easier for you as a developer so you don't have to write as much code by hand. So I decided to start playing around with code generation, kind of figure out what it's all about, how to get started with it, because I think that if I want any chance of developing any kind of library that a lot of people are going to use or is going to be very popular or useful in the Android ecosystem, probably I'm going to need to generate some code or it's at least, at the very least, not a bad skill set to add to my toolkit. So currently to me, it looks like the easiest way to start generating code on Android is to use this uh, third-party library created by Square, of course. They create all the best libraries. This is called Kotlin Poet, and essentially it makes it a little easier for you to start generating code. So I created a playground, and I started playing around with it a little bit. This playground is called Kotlin Poet poet uh, dash playground and by the way i don't suggest you like copy this code or use it in production or anything it's strictly a playground there's a lot of flaws this is what i would call very shitty code but that's what a playground's all about it's about figuring it out figuring out how it works and building something that uh, does something specific so you can start to understand how you know how it works so let me show you what i actually built so i sort of applied a dagger kind of flavoring to this little playground uh, basically what i wanted to do was i wanted to uh, create like an annotation like a module annotation uh, create like a provides annotation and have the code generator go through my code find those annot annotations and build the dependencies and add them to a single file that i can easily access so obviously this is not like exactly what dagger does this this would be like a very very small piece of what it does and you know a very shitty very very shitty version of it but just to go through the process of you know creating annotations how to look for annotations generate code uh, after discovering what those annotations are like marking and actually get something that works. So let me kind of take you through what I did and I encourage you to maybe, it's, this is not gonna be a very technical video, I'm just gonna take you through kind of what I did and highlight some main points so that maybe you can go check out Kotlin Poet, check out my playground and start playing around with code generation. So I built this very simple app that just says, you know, hello Mitch, hello Blake. Blake is my brother, if some of you didn't know that, I know it's just, you know, my brother always comes to mind as like the first name when I'm like, oh, okay, what kind of a, dummy name should I put here but anyway so um, getting the dependencies from the documentation is the first thing that you want to do everything's in here I'm not going to like go through that obviously because this is just like a high level overview of what you know this is all about but essentially you need three things to get started with this you need to build an annotation you need to build a processor for those annotations you need to mark up your code that uh, with those annotations so that the processor has uh, something to look at and generate code for so those are three main things you need to build an annotation, a processor to process the annotations, and then use the annotations in your code so that it does something. So the best way to do this that I think and all of the examples that I've seen is what they do is they create modules for, they create a module for where your annotations are gonna live, they create a module for where your processor is gonna live, and then you have like your modules with your, you know, your source code for your project. That's gonna be the app module here. By the way, if you don't know uh, how to build modules, how to make multi-module uh, projects on Android, I have a course. Currently, this is my newest course on codingwithmitch.com. It's called Modularizing Android Apps. I take you through kind of how to get started with modularization. We build a real project. I take you through like, um, you know, why it's important, why you should do it, um, what like what does it really do for your code. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it, but if you want to know about modularization, if you're an Android developer, you probably should know about modularization because if you have a job, the code base is going to be huge and there's going to be modules. So you might as well go and learn it if you haven't already learned it. First module that you're going to want to build is an annotation module. This is where you build the annotations. So if you take a look here, I have two annotations that I built, a module annotation and a provides annotation. Like I said, I'm going for a dagger-ish feel to this. Let me actually crank up my font size so you can see this a little better. All right, got a bigger font size. So I created an annotation called provides. It has a single argument I called argument name. I'll talk more about that in a second. And um, you know, this is going to be an annotation that you use on functions. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much more about it. If you want to know more, explore it yourself. Uh, now we have a module annotation. The difference that you'll notice here is that this is going on a class. 
this one is going on a function. So two different annotations, one for a class, one for a function. Once you have those annotations, you can start building your processor. So inside of the processor module here, I have a bunch of stuff. I'm not gonna talk about anything except for this my processor file right here. So let's open this up. And what this thing is, is think of it as like, a, it's like a worker class that is gonna scan your code, look through your code, and you can tell it what to look for. So again, all this is in the Kotlin Poet documentation, or you can look at you know, many different examples online, also my code, but essentially this has a process function. Inside the process function is where you write the things that you want this processor to do. So the first thing I wanna do is generate a factory class. The reason I'm generating a factory class is because uh, if you look at my, uh, maybe I'll talk about it later because it's not gonna make sense anyway, but we'll, I'll talk about why I have the factory class later. Uh, and then we have this other function called generate provides factories. First, let's actually look at the filter modules function. This is the one that's gonna filter through my code and look for those annotations. So filter modules, what this does, is it looks for the module annotations. Again, this code is very bad. It doesn't do any kind of checks, any kind of type checks. It just, it, it's very easy to this will break very easily, but I just wanted to get it working essentially. So just making sure that you don't like throw this into production or throw this into something that you're gonna show somebody, it would break very easily. So you have to very finely walk in the lines of uh, what you can do. If you walk slightly outside of that, the app is definitely gonna crash. So just so you know that. So it looks for all the modules, the module annotations, and then it goes through there and finds the provides functions inside of them. Once it does that, let me scroll back up to the top here. It's going to pass those modules to this generate provides factories function. And uh, then it takes the, the modules and it then looks for the provides annotations within those modules. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna generate factories that build the things that I declared. So that sounded confusing. Um, this is all gonna be very confusing, so don't like feel bad about it. I think the, the uh, language that Kotlin Poet uses to generate files is also very confusing. Like I still don't feel like I have a very good grasp of it. I just barely got enough done here to get something working. So just hang on. If you're confused, ignore what I just said. Let's go take a look at, uh, at like the modules. So let's go into the app module and take a look at how I use these annotations. So the goal here is I wanted to generate, I, I probably didn't say this at the beginning, I wanted to generate um, a module just like, or I want to use a module just like Dagger and provide dependencies in that module just like Dagger. So what we have here is we have an app module. I've annotated with my module annotation. I've used my provides annotation. I've wrote a function called provide person. Uh, here I'm providing a person named Mitch who weighs 200 pounds and giving him an argument name of Mitch. I have another provides function with an argument name of Blake. It's called provide another person. This will also return a person, but this one's named Blake and he weighs a little bit less. So like I said, with my processor, it's gonna go through all of my code, find the, the module annotations, then inside of the modules, it will find the provides annotations and grab this code and add it to a single dependencies file. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually build this so you can take a look and just see what's generated. All right, project has been built. Let's go into the app module here and go into the build directory, go into generated, go into source, go into Kotlin capped, and then take a look at the files that were generated. So the first thing here is the factory. This is that factory I said that we generate with the processor. So if I scroll up to the very top here, this generate factory function, it generates this interface right here. The reason I generated this is because you can't, uh, it's not, it's much easier to generate something and then reference that class than it is to actually put it in your source code and reference it in the processor. Uh, I don't even actually know if, no, you can't even do that because in, if you did that, you'd have to pull in a module that's part of your project code into the processor module, which doesn't really make sense. You wouldn't want to do that. So it's better, like if you have these simple classes, you might be thinking, oh, I could just put it in like my app module. But don't do that because you need to bring that into the processor. It's better just to have the processor generate it and then use it. So that factory that's generated, then it gets used to generate uh, factories for the, the provides uh, annotations. So like here we have app module underscore provide Blake factory. This is a uh, factory. So it's using that factory interface that I showed you right here. It's providing a person which person is it providing? It's providing another person. So notice that it, it copied the name of this function, provide another person. So if you look here, it says provide another person, person. It's referencing the app module and calling that function provide other person, which is Blake. So that's how that gets, that gets generated. Uh, likewise, the same thing is with provide Mitch. So it's like exactly the same other than 
it you, uh, calls the app module and does provide person since Mitch's function here is called provide person. And then the last file that gets generated is this app module dependencies file where both of those uh, both of those dependencies are added. So it's just a single file where I would have every single dependency. So in this case, we only have two people that are generated, Mitch and Blake. So now there's functions in here to access those objects. So then how would you use this? Well, let's go into uh, main activity. So open up main activity. And you can see here now that this is generated, I can create that app module dependencies instance. So it's an instance of this class right here. And then I can access the objects. So like here, I'm going dependencies.mitch, getting Mitch's name, dependencies.blake, getting Blake's name. So obviously with Dagger, it's much more sophisticated. You can inject things like you would do at inject, uh, late in it var, you would probably do Mitch person and inject the, the person like that, as opposed to just generating a single file with all the dependencies and then accessing them that way. So Dagger, like I said, is a much more sophisticated, more well-tested, more, it's just obviously way better. This is like, what I just did is for babies. Um, but uh, it gave me a little taste of code generation, kind of an idea of at least how it would be done. You know, you create an annotation, create or create annotations, create a processor, add the annotations to your code, generate the code. So again, if you want to take a look at uh, Kotlin Poet and code generation, I'll put some links down below that you can check out. You can check out my repo, my playground. Um, that's probably the best starting point because what I have here is very, very simple. I guarantee that you will struggle with the processor part just because the, the objects in the processor that you use to generate the code, I don't think that they're super intuitive. The documentation was kind of hard to read personally, I think. Uh, so my, my project is definitely a good place to start. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this video is the sponsor of this video. As most of you know, I started working at Square. Because I started working at Square, they sent me a new computer. They sent me a MacBook. They sent me an iMac. Basically, what that meant to me is I need to get a new desk because this is full. I have a desk here with my kind of recording setup. I got my Windows PC back there. There's no room on there, so I needed a new desk. And very conveniently, FlexiSpot actually reached out to me and said, hey, do you want us to send you a desk? Just do a short little demo on it and talk a little bit about it. You know what's funny? I actually reached out to FlexiSpot like, I don't know, probably six months ago or something like that. And I said, hey, do you want to send me a desk? I'll do a video. I got no reply back, but randomly they sent me a, an email and said, hey, do you want a desk? So it kind of worked out nicely for me. And these desks are actually the ones that I was looking at because they're probably uh, like the highest quality for the best price that I've seen out there. Like for example, that desk back there that I use for my PC, that desk I bought, I don't know, four or five years ago or something. And that was when standing desks were just starting to become popular. And it was very expensive. Like I think I spent thousand bucks on it or something like that. Even this one that this, that this computer is sitting on right now, I bought on Amazon for like 500 bucks and I thought that was a great deal. But FlexiSpot has way cheaper desks and they're just like they're there's no different than the one that i'm sitting at right now so let's go take a look at what it looks like and i'll do like a quick little um kind of like a, a couple shots of me building the desk what it looks like and uh see what my setup looks like on it so i got like the smallest one possible so this is the box size i know you can't really tell like how big that box is from this video here's all the parts that it comes with there's not a lot and i'm going to go through the assembly of this thing so first of all, you stand the posts up, you put them on. Uh, next is you attach these kind of side things on there. Then you put the tabletop together, slap it on top. And all of this took, I don't know, it maybe took me like an hour or something. I took a little longer because I goofed on the setup, those side pieces I put on backwards and upside down. So I had to take them off twice and, and rebuild it. I should probably just read the instructions next time. I'm really bad for that. I never read the instructions. So anyway, once I got it all set up, this is what it looks like. Here's kind of just a shot of it standing in my office. Uh, and now here's what it looks like with my new iMac sitting on it. And uh, I think it looks great. It's kind of, this is the smallest one they have, like I said, but it's perfect for what I'm gonna use it for because this is gonna be like a square only kind of workstation because I'm not allowed to work on my own stuff obviously on the square machine that doesn't make sense that they sent me a computer that I would work on you know coding with Mitch stuff on so that's not allowed so this is a square only machine so it's just going to sit right there and when I'm you know doing my day-to-day -day square work that is where I'm going to sit now here I'm going to show you a demo of me just kind of uh, pushing it up to as high as it can go I'm about 5'11 I'm not quite six feet tall but you can see like me standing here I wouldn't want it any any higher I guess if you were like 6'2 or 6'1, uh, maybe like 6'2, 6'3 actually. 
Uh, you might want a higher one, but you know, I don't, I don't really know. You'd probably be, um, you're probably still looking up. I don't know, depending on whatever is the most comfortable for you. I'm not really sure. So now we get to the best part about this desk and that's the price. They're actually doing a sale, I think till the end of September. Um, the desk that I got, I think is this one right here and it's only 152 or 153 euros. So in us, I think that's about $180 us. That is very cheap. Like, like the desk that I'm on right now, like I said, I bought from Amazon, which is pretty much identical to the flexi spot desk. It cost me 500 bucks. So that's far, far cheaper. 500 compared to well, it's us, I guess. So that would probably be like 200 and. I don't know, 220, 230 Canadian compared to around 500 Canadian. So it's, it's like half price. So these are uh, quite um, competitively priced. And again, the quality is not different than this $500 desk that I bought at Amazon. So like I said, they're doing a deal up until I think the end of September. I'll put a link down below if you wanna go check out that deal. FlexiSpot desk, thanks for sponsoring the video. I, uh, I like the desk and it's gonna work out perfect for my square workstation. That's gonna be it for this video. Go check out Code Generation, Kotlin Poet, and maybe check out FlexiSpot's website if you want a nice desk that is great quality and has a good price. I'll see you next time.